When I was a child, my brother and I had a paranormal research group we called M Factor in response to the movie Monster Squad. We went around the neighborhood fighting demons and vampires. We had binders full of research, which mostly amounted to pages ripped out of Fangoria or photocopied pages of Time Life's Mysteries of the Unknown. I was a little eight, nine-year-old version of the current me with a powerful imagination. One particular memory from this time that really sticks out in my mind is at the end of the block, there was this bar called Bunkies. And one day, in the little patch of grass between the crossroads and the sidewalk, there was a makeshift cross, and the ground looked disturbed. We asked one of the bar regulars what was buried there. I know, little children talking to drunks outside a bar. It was the 80s. It was a different time. The man looked us dead in the eye and said, Lincoln Throob, which means werewolf. Now, <laughs> do I really think that a monster hunter was having a midday drink at the corner bar, celebrating the kill from the previous day? Probably not. More than likely, there were three or four German shepherds that lived behind the bar, and I'm assuming one of them passed and was buried overnight. Or the old guy was just having some fun with a couple of kids. At the time, though, <laughs> wow, what a great story. It was everything little me wanted to hear. So that's what we're going to look at today. Real life cases of werewolves. Welcome to History, Mystery, and the Unexplained. This is the show where we explore everything from true crime to cryptids, the paranormal, and beyond. But before we get started, please like, subscribe, follow, or whatever on the platform of your choice. And be sure to give us a review. I'd love to hear what you think. A subset of the witch trials that took place in Europe from 1527 to 1725 was the werewolf trials. In total, 18 women and 13 men were accused of harming others in the guise of a wolf. Most of these trials involved a considerable amount of torture to get a confession out of the accused. Some of these people may have been murderers, but many were just hermits or loners. Perhaps the most famous of these is the legend of the Beast of Bedburg. As legend goes, the town of Bedburg, Germany was plagued by a rash of cattle mutilations. They had been torn open and devoured by some kind of beast. But soon it wasn't just farm animals, it was the women and the children in town. They were disappearing in the night. It was like something was hunting the villagers. When they found several limbs in a field, it was decided something needed to be done. The villagers gathered their hounds and followed the scent of the beast, and they saw it too. It was a great wolf. Days went on, and somehow it eluded them until finally the dogs cornered it. At last, they had captured the beast of Bedburg. But when the men looked at what they cornered, this was no beast. This was a man. A man they knew. Naked and cowering on the ground was the wealthy farmer known as Peter Stump. At the trial, Peter was put on the rack, and his body was stretched. It was only then that he confessed to his crimes. He said that at the age of 12, he had made a deal with the devil and was given a magic belt that would transform him into a wolf. The belt also gave him an insatiable appetite, though, and a great lust. Eventually, as a result of torture and threats of torture, Peter confessed to murdering and eating 14 children and two pregnant women. Of the women, he was quoted as saying he plucked the fetuses from their bodies and ate the baby's hearts panting and raw. They were dainty morsels, he said. He even confessed to murdering his own son and eating his brain and having sexual relations with his own daughter. On October 28th, 1589, Peter Stump was found guilty. The second confession resulted in his daughter being flayed, strangled, and her body burned, as incest was a high crime at the time. As for Peter Stump, his fate was far worse. He was put on a wheel, his skin was torn from his body using hot pincers. His arms and legs were broken with the dull end of an axe. And 
then he was beheaded. The remainder of his body was burned and his head was put on a spike as a warning to others. Now, before we continue, I feel a need to mention that this was a time of religious turmoil. Uh, Peter was a Protestant. His accusers were Catholics. With Peter and his daughter gone, the church would have then claimed his wealth and his land as their own. That said, I don't know what kind of torture you would have to do to me to get me to confess to half of what Peter is said to have claimed. Obviously, this is one of those cases where we will never really know what happened. And was he a vicious killer? Maybe. Was he a werewolf? Aside from the confession, the only other evidence we have is the dogs. And well, yes, there was a massive wolf scene. But he wasn't seen transforming. His magic belt was never found. So we don't know. The tale of Manuel Blanco Romasada is an unusual one. Manuel was born Manuela on November 18th, 1809. For the first six years of his life, he was raised as a girl. But then it was discovered that he was, in fact, a boy. By most accounts, his early life was fairly normal. It's presumed he came from wealth, as it's noted that he could read and write, which wasn't common in the Galicia area of Spain at the time. He grew up to become a tailor and a dressmaker and married in 1833. Just a year later, his wife passed and Manuel became a traveling salesman and a guide throughout parts of Spain and Portugal. In 1844, he was charged with the murder of Vicente Fernandez. No, not that one. Fernandez was attempting to collect a debt from Blanco before his body was discovered. Blanco immediately fled to Portugal and as a result was given an automatic 10-year prison sentence for failure to turn up in court. After a year in hiding, he turned up in Portugal under the assumed identity of Antonio Gomez. But something must have shifted in his brain. It was either the death of his wife or the murder of Fernandez, because Blanco continued to kill. Women and children he was guiding across the mountains turned up missing. He was caught selling their clothes, and he also sold soap. Soap made from human fat. In September of 1852, he was arrested in Nambala. His defense? Lycanthropy. Um, so if I'm out in the woods, I'm full on wolf. The court didn't buy it. The werewolf of Alaris, the tallow man, Manuel Blanco Romasada, was convicted of nine of the 13 murders he confessed to. And four were determined to be committed by a wolf, the other nine by a man. Signs of butchering were present on the bodies. On the 6th of April, 1853, he was sentenced to death by Garrett. The sentence was carried out just a few months later. Now, there's no question that Blanco committed these murders, but did he suffer from lycanthropy? Or maybe clinical lycanthropy, at least. And though extremely rare, there have been 43 cases of clinical lycanthropy documented. These are people who truly believe that they can transform into animals. And it's not always wolves. Uh, hyenas, tigers, snakes, foxes, e even buffalo. One truly bizarre case comes from a 25-year-old milkman who, after being brought into a psychiatric facility by his family, said that he truly believed he was transforming into a buffalo. He said that he had had sexual relations with one of his buffalo six months prior, and he believed that he had absorbed buffalo DNA and was it was changing him. He was constantly washing his hands and his genitals in an effort to undo the effects of what happened. He walked around on all fours. He nodded his head. He ate grass and hay. Amazingly, this case study showed that drug therapy worked and he got better. Now, I'm not saying that I believe Blanco was a wolf man, but I am willing to believe that he thought he was. So here we have two stories of people who confess to being werewolves. But what about seeing werewolves? Not just large wolves, but 
wolf-like being standing on two legs. Surely, if the wolfman is real, someone saw one at one point, right? Nineteen thirty-six. Mark Shackelman was making his rounds. He was the night watchman at the Coletta School for the Exceptional Children in Jefferson, Wisconsin. The grounds included a few buildings, an open field, and several preserved Indian burial mounds. Shankleman was armed with nothing more than a flashlight. Most days, he needed nothing more than a flashlight. This was rural Wisconsin, after all. Most nights on his patrol were quiet. But this night was different. As Shankleman made his way through the field, he saw a shadow skulk past him. He then saw some kind of creature digging into one of the burial mounds. It was dog-like, but it was huge, standing six to seven feet tall on its hind legs. As he got closer, the creature turned its attention from the mound over to him. Its eyes glowed red in the reflection of the flashlight beam. It bared its sharp white fangs. The air smelled putrid like rot. Suddenly, it let out a noise that was like a growl, but like it was talking at the same time. It sounded almost human, while simultaneously being beast-like. The beast dropped to all, all fours and then fled into the woods. The next day was much the same, but then it disappeared for a while. Throughout the 80s and 90s, sightings returned, except now the beast had moved 45 minutes southeast to Elkhorn. Most of what we know about this creature that has become known as the Beast of Bray Road comes from reporter Linda Godfrey and the article she wrote for The Week, a local Wisconsin newspaper. One day in 1989, around 1.30 in the morning, Lori Andresi was driving home on Bray Road. She had just finished her shift at the jury room, a lounge in Elkhorn, where she worked as a manager. On the side of the road, she saw a large creature. It was kneeling, she said. Its elbows were up and its claws were facing out, so I knew it had claws. I remember the long claws. Unlike the encounter that Shankleman had 50 years earlier, the creature didn't run away. It just stared at her before returning to its meal. Terrified, Andreezy sped away. In a later interview, she said it was night. It was quite late. But I know what I saw. You don't mistake something like that. To this day, I believe it was satanic. It was just my feeling. I don't believe in werewolves, per se. But I believe that something could be, well, conjured up. That thing, that was no dog. That was too big to be a dog. That thing was bigger than me. Just two short years later came another report. 18-year-old Doris Gibson was driving along Bray Road on Halloween night of 1991 when she suddenly felt something hit her car in the fog. The car lifted off the ground slightly. When she pulled to the side of the road and looked, there was nothing there. And then it happened. Something rushed towards her out of the dark forest. Here comes this thing, and it's just running up at me, she said. It was no dog. It was bigger than me. I've never seen a human run like that, and my uncle was a track star. Gibson dove into her car and sped away. The thing leapt in the air and landed on the trunk, but thanks to the gentle rain, it just slipped off the wet metal and tumbled to the road. Later that same night, she again found herself on Bray Road. She had picked up a friend from a party and was taking her home. Suddenly, her friend pointed out the window and screamed. The creature was back. Gibson slammed on the gas and sped home. Deep claw marks show bare metal on the back of her blue Plymouth Sundance. This opened up the floodgates to more stories, which Linda Godfrey used to fill the pages of many books, including The Beast of Bray Road, Michigan Dogman, Real Wolfman, and many, many more. There are, of course, many doubters of these stories saying that they are folklore. They are just outright hoaxes. Many skeptics point at the debunked Gable film as proof it's all a hoax. This film allegedly turned up at a garage sale and was purchased. The new owner brought it home and decided to view it. 
it started out in with mundane footage of some snowmobiles, dog sniffing around, a man working on his car, and then out of nowhere, a muscular dog-like beast rushes out of the forest towards the cameraman. The footage ends with the camera on the ground and the jaws of this great beast flash past. People also love to say that the beast that was sighted were wolves or bears. Yes, there are bears in Wisconsin, northern Wisconsin. All the sightings of the beast of Bray Road exist in the southern, southeastern section of Wisconsin. Now, for the sake of comparison for our non-American listeners, Wisconsin is almost two and a half times the size of Ireland. There is certainly a difference between what's happening in the north and what's happening in the south. I'm not saying that all these stories are true, but I don't think we could completely discredit everything. Something is happening in the forests and farms of Wisconsin. So, are werewolves real? This is a legend that dates back to the Epic of Gilgamesh and the writings of the Greeks, the Romans, and the Norse. In other words, this is a legend that dates back to when legends begun being written down. And Gilgamesh himself is turned into a werewolf by Ishtar and sent to kill his friend Enkidu. In Norse mythology, Loki uses a belt of power to turn into a wolf and eat Odin's son, Fenir. Remember the magic belt of Peter Stump. We have the legends of the Rogaru in North America and the tales of the Lobzon in South America. From China to Germany to France to Ireland, there are legends of werewolves across the globe. And that's enough for me, at least, to say, what if? <laughs> Till next time, I'm Christopher Damien. This is History Mystery and the Unexplained. And thank you for listening.